Okay. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Kevin Mitchell. Today, I want to talk to you all about a vulnerability that I discovered while testing a phone as key system. Um, the official vulnerability title is um, CVE 2023-52709. Um, the name of this talk is Bluetooth Blues Unmasking CVE 2023-52709, the TIBLE5 stack attack. Okay, so here's the agenda. Um, first, I'm going to do a brief introduction, uh, go into a little bit of a speaker bio, um, look at the impact of denial of service attacks on keyless entry systems, and then we're going to jump into the origin of the vulnerability itself, um, the timeline, the testing setup, the testing results, the outcome, the consequences, and then I want to talk to you about the vulnerability disclosure process uh, with Texas Instruments and Bosch. And then we're going to jump into the denial of service attack details, looking at the attack mechanisms, also looking at uh, some Wireshark analysis. And then I'm going to jump into the root cause analysis, give you some context uh, behind the root cause analysis, some background, and then a detailed explanation. Um, then we're going to jump into the affected devices, the um, initial assessment of the affected devices, um, the updated list after um, a couple of months of, you know, looking at this vulnerability, um, you know, we found that it was more and more devices that were impacted by it. Um, then we're going to look at some of the real world impacts, potentially um, the supplier pre-production cost of the vulnerability, just looking at it from how much it would cost like Texas Instruments uh, before um, these devices actually go into vehicles. And then um, just to give you some context, look at like some NISTA recall like numbers as far as like how many recalls are, are typically done by NISTA on a year to year basis. And then going to the mitigation strategy, um, how Texas Instruments put out like an SDK to mitigate this issue. And then the conclusion, outcome, consequences. And then we're going to do a uh, question and answers. And then you all can connect with me if you like. So a little bit about myself. My name is Kevin Mitchell. Um, I've been doing IT since about 2008, once I joined the Army as a Human Resources Information Management System Specialist. Um, then I worked for Hewlett Packard for a little bit. Um, then I went to FCA, um, where I was hired as a certified ethical hacker on the Uconnect team after the infamous Jeep hack. I was like the only cybersecurity professional on the Uconnect team out of like a team of 30 QREs. Um, I was like the only one specializing in automotive uh, cybersecurity then. And then I went on to work for Mercedes-Benz Financial Services, where I was doing some penetration testing, vulnerability management, as well as penetration testing management. Um, then I got into like some web application penetration testing and then now to my current job right now where I am a senior automotive security tester where I work for a company called ETOS. And ETOS's primary goal is to um, enhance tom tomorrow's automotive software. And so like the way that I contribute to that goal is just by being an automotive security tester. I had cars. And so I want to give you a quote by a famous hacker. Um, the advance of technology is based on making it fit in so that you really don't even notice it. So it's a part of everyday life um, by Bill Gates, right? And so um, if, you, if you look at technology, right, it's really baked into every aspect of our life. Like from the time that you wake up, you're probably using technology to make coffee um, to your daily commutes. And that's really where I want to focus on because I'm, you know, automotive security tester. So I'm looking at technology when it comes to the automotive industry. And so... Um, I, I'm not here to pick on any one OEM, um, but I just did a random Google search, like how many vehicles does GM produce in a year? And so it says in the year 2023, GM sold about 6.2 million vehicles, right? So my next point is what is the average cost of an automotive recall? And so that average cost of an automotive recall is about $500. And so if you're looking at 6.2 million vehicles times 500, you really get to see like the impact. And that might not be an accurate number, but we're just, you know, providing these numbers for context and seeing like how much, you know, a recall could actually affect your everyday life. And so um, leads me to my next quote. The problem with technology is when it doesn't work, you're SOL. That's from a clerk 
at a corner store after a failed tap to pay. So now I'm gonna jump into the origin of the CVE itself. Okay, so if you look at these updates, I didn't provide exact dates for them, I just kind of provided the months, but if, if you're tracking, we'll just say each update was a different day. So the first update, um, Texas Instruments acknowledges the vulnerability disclosure that we provided them on the phone as key systems in the BLE5 stack. The next update, the next day, um, the Texas Instruments engineers were unable to reproduce the issue um, based on the report that we sent them. Um, then I replied with instructions on how to actually reproduce the issue. Uh, the next day they came back and said, we cannot reproduce this issue. And so after that, I doubled down and just reworded my previous email in telling them how to reproduce the issue. And then, um, you know, we're working with Bosch. So a couple of Bosch engineers suggested that I test the, the uh, TI launch pad, which is just like, um, yeah, it's, it's essentially just like a, a microcontroller that's used for development. And they were like, you, you should pretty much test the launch pad to see if you can get the launch pad to fail in the same way that you got the phone as key systems to fail. And so um, the next update, TI engineers were asking me clarifying questions and tripling down based on the previous communications that they actually couldn't just reproduce the issue. So then I decided to schedule a meeting with uh, the stakeholders, I demoed the issue and I was able to reproduce the issue and show them the actual testing method on how I was actually able to do that. Um, and this is happening, you know, this is going on the, the entire month of August and then the entire month of September. And so the, uh, the Bosch engineers um, that I actually worked with, they were able to reproduce the same issue that we had initially sent them, that we had initially sent Texas Instruments. And so the reason why it was important that Bosch engineers actually, you know, helped me verify that this was actually an issue because if I'm telling them they have a vulnerability and I'm the only one who can, sh who can demo the vulnerability, is it really a vulnerability? Or if it's not really reproducible by anybody besides me, is it even something that um, can, can be verified? Where's the veracity in that? So then um, we actually had the Bosch engineers come into the ETAS office and um, the Bosch engineers were also able to reproduce the issue on the phone as key systems. And before then, I was able to reproduce the issue on the launch pad, like they suggested. And so we now have, I was able to reproduce the issue on the phone as key systems and the launch pad, and Bosch engineers were able to do the exact same thing. And so at this point, I think it's a pretty good time to report it to Bosch PSER. And the reason why I reported it to Bosch PSER is because they're a CNA. Um, they have the ability to... They have the ability to create CVEs. And so, you know, I wanted to get this out there as soon as possible. So then Texas Instruments stakeholders um, respond um, to Bosch really, you know, putting forth that, that CVE and, and contacting them. And uh, they said that they needed, you know, time to review the issue and try to reproduce again. So the next update, you know, this happened, like I said, um, August, September, November, um, yeah, August, September, October, November. And by the time we get to November, the TI eng engineers are like quadrupling down and they're pretty much saying, we're gonna stop testing this issue until, until you can show us exactly how to do this. But at this time, I had already shown them how to do this like three or four times. Um, so internally, TI is actually escalating this issue. And then um, Bosch, some Bosch engineers pretty much detail the differences in Texas Instruments testing setup and my testing setup. A few moments later, uh, Texas Instruments engineers are finally able to reproduce the vulnerability on the launch pad or AKA the CC26X2R1. And the reason why um, this is important, this is important is because the vulnerability, or I'm sorry, the responsible disclosure period does not start until um, after the engineers of the responsible company are able to reproduce the issue. And so that responsible disclosure period was about like six months. And so that, mean, that meant that I actually couldn't talk about this vulnerability until six months till after they were able to reproduce the issue. Coincidentally enough, 
two weeks after they were able to reproduce the issue, they had a mitigating SDK and they were ready to push out that, um, the, the, the mitigations. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into like the testing setup. And uh, I forgot to give my disclaimer that all the images were created by ChatGPT, but we have like an Alice in Wonderland theme here. So you'll keep seeing like Alice in Wonderland um, kind of theme here. And what I'm trying to show with this image is like, you're using legacy systems on new vehicles. You're using the legacy technology on new vehicles and there's pretty much making them vulnerable. So the hardware setup that, you know, we use was gonna be the CCX2, the CC26X2R1 as the, the as the device under test. And then we also had a BLE um, 654 dongle as the central device that's actually connecting to the device under test and testing it. And then we're also using um, a Defensix test case. The specific test case for this vulnerability was test case 1001, and it's a security manager uh, protocol test case. And I'll jump into that in detail. Shout out to Synopsys for uh, and Defensix for you know uh, helping me discover this vulnerability and you know having the tools that allow me to do my job. So that's my quick shout out. So the testing results. So the outcome of the test when running Defensix fuzzing test case 1001 on loop mode. The device under test um, using a resolvable private address uh, for connecting um, or connect connectable advertising, the device ends up generating unresolvable um, RPAs after a while, which causes a denial of service. And I'll really jump into this. So I went back and forth with um, with Texas Instruments on the CVE base score because in the phone as a key system it failed every time. And once it failed, if you are using your phone as a key and you lock your door and I come behind you and run this exploit, um, you actually can't get back into your vehicle until you hard reset the vehicle. So if we're looking at the CIA con or you know triad, we're looking at confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In my mind, if I knocked off one of those you know triads, if I knocked off availability, I would think it's a high severity vulnerability at the very least. But they you know came back and said you know this is the case when it comes to phone as key systems, but it might not be the case in every other application that uses the TI BLE five stack. And so that made me think that oh this might be a little bit bigger. Um, you know, issue than just automotive. So the consequence of this is the vulnerability can impact um, BLE devices running the affected SDK versions and um, the, the devices that are enabled with Bluetooth privacy with resolvable private address feature. And I'm going to jump into this a little bit later about the context about the RPAs. And so the vulnerability disclosure, the, um, you know, the vulnerability disclosure um, that, that the Texas Instruments PSERT team came back and pretty much they created an internal PSERT ID and this is the PSERT ID and this was the initial, uh, the initial advisory, the very, very initial advisory before we started to discover how many different devices that this actually affected. So they just labeled this as the CCX or CC26X2R1 BLE denial of service through unexpected RPAs. And like I said, this is just the, the first response that they gave us. When Bosch PSER actually published um, their security advisory based on what Texas Instruments sent us, uh, they created the CVE with the same base score and they updated the title of that CVE to TI Bluetooth stack can fail to generate resolvable random private addresses leading to a denial of service for already peer bonded devices. And I'm gonna jump into that because it's it's, you know, it's kind of deep because if a device is already peer bonded to it and I'm running this attack on it, then every device that was previously um, connected to it will not be able to actually connect to it again until there is a hard reset. And if we're talking about a vehicle, then you actually have to get into the vehicle and hard reset the vehicle or restart it. But if you're only, if you're only like using your phone as a key, then how are you gonna do that? So looking at the details itself, um, we're looking at Defensix test case 1001, and this is specifically on the CC26X2R1. And the reason why I'm showing this is because um, Defensix test case 1001 does not always work on the, the, the development chip or the development board. But 
the test case works 100% of the time on the phone as key systems. Um, and the reason why I decided to escalate this to Bosch P-Cert is because there was another test case that worked specifically on uh, the phone as key systems and on the CC26X2R1. And this is test case three. And I'm not sure how small that font is, but I can kind of go over it with you all. So you get a pairing request, and then you get a pairing confirm that the that um, the testing device or the central is sending the device under test. So it sends it a, a pairing request, and then it also sends it a pairing confirmation, and then it sends it a pairing random. And when it sends it that pairing random, essentially, encryption fails and the device no longer is responding to previously peer bonded devices. And this is a little bit of context to showing you exactly like the, the, the structure of the packets that um, were being sent to the device under test. Okay. And so we're looking at a Wireshark uh, analysis of test case three um, because test case three is, is, you know, something that we're building our proof of concept off of. So like I said, you send it the 128 bytes plus uh, the A byte header, and it receives that the parent request. And then it, then you also send it a parent confirmation, and then you send it a parent random. And so we developed a POC that pretty much automates the connection of the pairing process with the Bluetooth device, um, sending a specific sequence of pairing messages that, re you know, like I said, the pairing request, pairing confirmation, pairing random. And like I said, this will pretty much get the device to fail 100% uh, of the time. So we'll have a GitHub, and the POC isn't published as of yet, but as soon as I get done with this talk, I'll make sure that I make this like available to, to everybody. And so if we're looking at the root cause analysis, this is where it's going to get maybe a little technical, maybe a little bit boring. Um, every Bluetooth low energy device has a unique 48-bit address. And these addresses are pretty much characterized into public addresses and then random addresses. And the random addresses can be further classified into static addresses or private addresses and depending on whether or not they change. And furthermore, uh, private addresses can either be resolvable or non-resolvable. So all BLE devices must either have a public address or a random static address. And they also can have a resolvable or non-resolvable private address which is pretty much just typically used for like security reasons. And so this is the boring but exciting part for me. Okay, so you have random addresses, random private addresses, which are pretty much used in addition to public or random static addresses when a device wishes to protect its privacy. And then moving on to the resolvable random private addresses, uh, a resolvable private address is true to its name, um, it's intended to have users like have this pre-share key um, that the device can pretty much figure out the address every time it changes. And so the pre-share key is the identity resolving key, which is used to generate and resolve random addresses. Kind of boring stuff, right? And then we have non-resolvable random private addresses. And non-resolvable random private addresses is, is pretty much used by devices when they want to prevent tracking. And this is not commonly used, but it's, it's, it's relevant um, for this, you know, hack. And so um, providing a little bit of context, um, the BLE um, core specification or the Bluetooth 5.3 core specification of volume six, part B, uh, 4.7, the resolving list. If the link layer using the resolving list and the peer device has been resolved, but encryption fails, the resolvable private address shall be immediately discarded and a new private address will be generated. So this is kind of like, you know, where we're looking at, I'm providing you all a little bit of context as well as like this root cause analysis. So this is what we received back from Texas Instruments um, verbatim for like the reason for the failure. So the malform packet in our stack map link layer encrypt decrypt will return false and then trigger RPA update. But however, at this point, the stack has not terminated the link. So for the next ACL packet within the same connection, that function will still get called. And when that function gets called right before the RPA update is happening, then the RPA update using encryption will fail, which leads to non-resolvable private addresses. And so the reason why I gave you this context 
text before is because it's like the device is actually operating according to the Bluetooth stack itself or according to the Bluetooth specification itself, right? It receives um, a pairing request, it receives a pairing confirmation, and then it receives a pairing random, and that pairing random actually makes the encryption fail. And once the encryption fails, then the MAC address is automatically discarded. The MAC address is automatically discarded, and when the MAC address is automatically discarded, every previously peer bonded device can no longer co can connect to the device. So uh, that's what we're seeing, and that's kind of like you know the root cause analysis of of the vulnerability itself. Um, I found it exciting, you know, to, to to really do like a deep dive and understand exactly what's happening because it's not like Texas Instruments like did a bad job at actually like you know, developing the system, um, things just happen too fast. And like I said, the, the, the link wasn't actually terminating, so it just caused a denial of service. So now we want to look at the def affected devices. So initially we had um, 19 different uh, affected parts and two different um, software development kits. And so these are all the kits um, and the software versions that were affected by it in the software stack. I was pretty proud of myself, like the BLE 5 stack, you know, uh, vulnerability on that. It seemed, you know, rewarding, especially being a, a penetration tester on automotive, uh, you know, on vehicles. And sometimes if you don't go about it the right way, you really can't talk about some of your research. And so this was just a confirmation that we went about it the right way. We handled the responsible disclosure period the right way. And now, you know, we're, you know, enjoying the fruits of my labor. So Texas Instruments, after a couple of months, um, you know, I was asking them, hey, when are you guys going to publish? When are you guys going to publish? And I realized that they weren't publishing because they were still discovering devices within their inventory that were still vulnerable. And so they updated it from 19 parts to, tw to 28 parts in six different uh, software versions. Um, and I found this pretty interesting, right? There's a BLE 5 stack, BLE 5 stack, uh, BLE stack 2.x. I don't know what that is. But at any rate, we have, you know, an updated parts list and it included 28 parts. And um, I did a, you know, a little bit of a research on the, on all of these parts that are listed here. I was looking at the real world impact. And so if you go on TexasInstruments.com, you can actually search their inventory by parts. And so I was able to see all of these vulnerable parts that were listed here. And what I have in bold are just the automotive parts. And so, you know, I'm suspecting in Texas Instruments, the reason why they said that this is not a high severity vulnerability is because they have other devices, such as like medical devices, that this, vulner that this vulnerability is, is, is present on. And I haven't done the research to see, you know, what devices are actually affected but, you know, I was just more so uh, concerned about, like, the automotive part of it. So there's, like, uh, 2.6 million devices that they have in their inventory, and that's about $2.6 million in inventory that they have. But that is before these devices actually get sold to any OEM, and the OEM puts their software on top of that. So that's why I call it a supplier pre-production cost of the vulnerability, because we're just looking at it from... Texas Instruments, we're not looking at it if like GM or Ford purchased one of these and then they developed, uh, you know, vulnerable software on top of that. And so I think I'm, think I'm good on time. I got like two minutes left. Okay, so um, NIST the recall. So, um, you know, I believe this is for the year 2022 and we're just looking at electrical systems. And so if we have, you know, 3.4 million, you know, electrical system recalls averaging at around like $500, then that's like $1.7 billion, right? And the reason why I put this here is because like, as, as a security engineer or as a penetration tester, it's kind of hard to quantify your impact on the world. It's kind of hard to quantify exactly, you know, the impact that you're having on figuring out some of these things. And so my thing is like, say for instance, each one of these recalls doesn't cost $500. Maybe if it only costs 1% of that, we're still looking at $17 million. So you should really just do a penetration test on your system before you're stuck paying, you know, for recalls that, that might cost you, you know, billions or millions of dollars. And so, like I said before, it was pretty interesting that Texas Instruments um, was able to come up with 
a fix and publish that fix two weeks after they were able to reproduce it but couldn't reproduce the issue for like six months. Uh, I, I thought that was, I, you know, genius of them. Um, and this is the mitigating strategies that they put out. I know that they still have a lot of um, SDKs that they have to publish in order to make sure that all of the systems um, are mitigated or remediated in the right way. Um, but they're still working on that right now. And right on time, uh, questions? Any questions? Right there. So for scanning and uh, talking to the launch pad, um, we use uh, Defensix as well. Um, we also use um, Bluetooth CTO, um, and we also use um, the TI launch pad with um, a software called Sniffle that was um, developed by NCC Group, um, and it specifically scans for um, long-range advertisements or extended advertisements um, that are specific to BLE5, um, if that answers your question. Mr. McKeever. Oh, can I get this last question right here? All of the devices, the 19 devices are in the CVE. The, the extended list has not been uh, updated or published yet. We're still with, you can get it. Yes, yes. And I believe that this is, is publicly available. There's a QR code. You guys can connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you for your time.